former leader of UKIP, Nigel Farage. Um, Article 50 has been triggered. We're leaving the EU, the single market and the customs union. Uh, what's there for you to complain about? Uh, the deal. You know, all of that's going to happen and hopefully we're going to get the trigger this week and that's good news. Uh, what worries me a little bit is I'm not sure the government recognise how strong their hand is. You know, just this week at the summit in Brussels, the word in the corridors is that we're prepared to give away our fishing waters mm. as a bargaining chip. So, so the worry is what deal we get. Are we leaving? Yes, I'm pleased about that. But in the end, you are uh, uh, an irrelevant voice on the deal because the deal will be voted on in Parliament and you have one MP. Well, I think actually you're missing the point, aren't you? The real vote in Parliament isn't in London, it's going to be in Strasbourg. And this is, this, this is perhaps the biggest obstacle that the British government faces. It's not what happens in, in the Commons, it's that ultimately, at the end of the two years, the European Parliament could veto the deal. Now, what that means is I think we need to adopt a different approach to this. We don't need just to be lobbying in the corridors of Brussels to get a good deal. We need, as a country, to be out there talking to the German car workers, talking to the Belgian chocolate makers, putting as much pressure as we can on politicians from across the whole of Europe to come to a sensible arrangement. After all, it's in their interests even more than ours. In what way is the vision of Brexit set out by David Davis this morning and in other times any different from your own? Uh, well, listen, I'm delighted that there are people uh, now adopting the position that I argued for many, many years. Good. So you, but you, it now, but like, it, like Douglas Carswell, are you? Uh, he said he found Mr. Davis's performance this morning quote very reassuring. Well, it is reassuring, uh, but and just as when Theresa May was Home Secretary, every performance she gave was hugely reassuring. In fact, she was uh, seen to be a heroine after her Tory conference speeches, and then didn't deliver. We have to see. Uh, I, I'm, I'm just concerned, Andrew, that even before we start, we're making concessions. Uh, you've described the EU's uh, divorce bill demands, a figure of 60 billion euros has been floated around. You said that's laughable, and I don't yeah. understand why you're saying that. Yeah. But do you maintain that we won't have to pay a penny to leave the well, EU? just think about this. It's nine months since we voted Brexit, and assuming we trigger Article 50 this week and it goes on for two years, mm -hmm. net, we'll have paid 30 billion in since the British people had a vote and mm. said we should but leave. But we're still members. Uh, we are still members, but I, honestly, I don't think there's any appetite in this country for us to pay a massive divorce bill. Uh, there are, there oh, are, I understand there's no... And there are also assets but, but here my too, question was not a penny? Well, uh, there will be some ongoing commitments, mm. but the numbers that are being talked about are 50 or 60 billion pounds are frankly... Laughable. Well, you've said that is laughable, yeah. but I'm just trying to, to, to find out if, you, if you'd be prepared to accept some kind of exit cost. It may be nowhere near 60 billion. Uh, and of course, we have to do a net agreement as well. The yeah, yeah, government yeah. briefed about our share of the European Investment Bank, which is very chunky yeah, yeah. too. But would you accept a deal, perhaps in transitional arrangements and so on, five, 10 billion as part of the divorce settlement? Well, all I know is we're paying in net 30 million pounds every single day at the moment, 10 billion pounds plus every year. Um, and, and, that, and that's just our contribution at the moment. We are going to make a massive saving on this. Uh, what do you make of um, what Anna Subri was saying there, that if there is no deal, and mm. uh, that is now being talked about more, I mean, it may be the government managing expectations here, there is still an expectation we will have a deal. Mm. But if there is a no, no deal, that the government can't then just go to WTO rules, that it has to have a vote in Parliament. What do you make of that? Well, by the time we get to that, there'll be a general election coming down the tracks of this anyway. So mm -hmm. I suspect uh, that if, at the end of this two-year process, there is no deal... Oh, and by the way, no deal is a lot better for the nation than where we currently are, because we have freed of regulations, we'll be able to make our own deals in the world. I think then what would happen, and if, if, if Parliament effectively was to say it did not back the end of the Brexit negotiation, a general election would happen pretty quickly. Let me come on to a, another uh, subject, and then I'm going to go back to Anna Subri. But I want to get this to you first. According to reports this morning, one of your most senior aides has passed a dossier to police claiming the Tories committed electoral fraud in Thanet South, the seat you contested in the general election. What evidence do you have? Uh, I, I, I've read that in the newspapers, uh, just as you have, um, and I'm not going to comment on it. Well, you're not aware of the contents of the dossier? Uh, I don't know anything about the dossier. 
Even I, though he was I your election know. strategist? Well, I, yes, he was. In and, Stan at Sun. And, and, and I, I am actually quite dubious as to whether this dossier exists at all. I think perhaps the newspapers have got this wrong. Were there concerns about the downloading of data uh, that took place from that constituency? Yes, but beyond that, we don't know anything. What about the part of this downloading was allegedly, he's re re he has uh, refuted it, done by Mr. Carswell, your MP, uh, to give information to the Tories. Do, do you have evidence of that? Uh, we have evidence that Mr. Carswell downloaded information. We have no evidence of what he did with it. Uh, no evidence that he gave, gave it to the Tories? No evidence at all. If, um, I, and of course it's not just your aid who has been making allegations against the Conservatives in uh, Thanet South and in other seats uh, as well. Yeah. If the evidence was uh, to be substantial and if it was to result in another a by-election being called, that the election in Thanet South had to be yeah. fought again, would you be the UKIP candidate? Well, I probably would. You probably would? Yeah. Just probably? Just probably. It would be your eighth attempt? Well, do you know what? Winning seats in Parliament under a first-past-the-post system is not the only way to change politics in Britain. I would like to think I've proved that. Very well. Let's go back to Anna Subri, who was uh, l listening to that. Uh, Anna Subri, I think the implica implication, what we were saying on the panel at the start of the show, and I think what Nigel Farage was saying there would be that if at the end of this process, whatever the vote, the government was to lose it, it would probably provoke a general election. What's your reaction? No, no, I think that would be right, because, look, I mean, let's get real. I mean, the government is not going to come to Parliament with anything other than something that it believes is a good deal. So if Parliament rejected it, which I think would be extremely unlikely, then obviously it would be a de facto a, a vote of no confidence and it would be, therefore, within the terms of the Fixed Parliaments Act and that would be it. So I think we should be... I think I'll tell you what the real problem is, Andrew. I think more likely is that because of the stories that are being put up about the 50 billion, maybe 60 billion, uh, and you look at the way that things are being flagged up, that actually both the Prime Minister and Boris Johnson say we should be asking them for some money back. I think the big fear, the, certainly the fear I have, is that we'll be crashing out in six months. You think and we, that could, the leave, press, we, yeah, you think think we the, could leave as quickly as six months? Explain that to me. Because I think that they will stoke up the demand from the EU for 60 billion, 50, 60 billion back. Right. And my very real concern is that within six months where we're not making much progress, maybe nine months, we're not making much progress and people are getting increasingly fed up with the EU because right. they're being told it wants right. unreasonable demands and then we crash out. And I think what is happening is that the government is putting in place basically scaffolding at the bottom of the cliff to break our fall when we come to fall off that cliff. Mm. And I think many in government are actually preparing, not for a two-year process, but six to nine months off the cliff, out we go. Oh, that's my uh, real fear. And that's very interesting. I've not heard that expressed before by, by someone in your position. I suspect, though, that you've just made Nigel Farage's day. Exactly. It's a lovely thought. And but, exactly. uh, but I would just, I would just say to Anna Subri, she's, she's really a bit out of date uh, with all of this. You know, 40 years <coughs> ago, there was a good argument for joining the common market because tariffs around the world were so high. All of that has fundamentally changed with the World Trade Organization. And we're leaving the European Union, Anna, and we're rejoining a great big world out there. It's terribly yeah. exciting. But what we're not yeah, going to do this morning is world. refight the referendum. <laughs> well, she was. <laughs> we should, no, she was giving an interesting no, uh, perspective on what could happen in six and nine months rather than two years. But exactly. we'll, we'll leave it There's there. No Anna Subri, Nigel Farage, I thank, thank you both.